Breathe in and breathe out. Breathing is the most natural thing to do, from our first to our last breath. But have you ever thought that the air you breathe contains pollutants? Although you cannot see them, you inhale them, and they can damage your health and the environment. Severe air pollution in New Delhi, smog in Beijing, ozone pollution in Paris because of poor air quality. Air pollutants affect us everywhere, even if we are far away from the point where they are emitted into the atmosphere. We have been living with the effects of air pollution for years. During the 1960s, scientists found that air pollutants, often emitted thousands of kilometers away, were causing the acid rain that was destroying the forests, causing fish loss in lakes, and putting entire ecosystems at risks in the Northern Hemisphere. Two landmark conferences in the 70s the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment and the Helsinki Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, and many more formal and informal talks between several countries on both sides of the Iron Curtain, paved the way for negotiations on an intergovernmental agreement to reduce air pollution. In 1979, 32 countries signed the UN ECE Convention on Long Range Transboundary Air Pollution the first international treaty to deal with air pollution on a broad regional basis. Entering into force in 1983, the convention laid down the general principles of international cooperation for air pollution abatement and set up an institutional framework that has brought together science and policy. The scientific network under the convention has successfully developed a common knowledge base, including a scientific infrastructure providing for joint monitoring, modeling, and effects-based programs. In the early days of the convention, and actually before the convention, there was quite some serious scientific disagreement about the question how long air pollution stays in the atmosphere. And the breakthrough came then uh, through the establishment of the convention and especially of the EMAP protocol where all the parties agreed to conduct common monitoring activities and to develop and do some modeling activities which explain the, mon the, the monitored value. And through these joint activities, which were approved every year also politically, uh, there was a common understanding growing. In the early days of the convention, the focus was on building a sound scientific base. Subsequently, emphasis was put on development and negotiation of gradually more advanced protocols while ensuring that scientific knowledge was kept up to date. The current phase involves the examination and review of protocols, implementation and compliance, and positioning of the convention in the global context. While the first protocols to the convention addressed one substance at a time, prescribing the same flat rate emission reductions for all parties, parties increasingly recognize that various air pollutants interact in the atmosphere, lead to combined impacts, and are often caused by the same sources. This led to the negotiation of the 1999 Gothenburg Protocol to abate acidification, eutrophication, and ground level ozone, the first multi-pollutant, multi-effect protocol. The 2012 revision of the Gothenburg Protocol resulted in the first binding agreement to include emission reduction commitments for fine particulate matter, including the short-lived climate pollutant black carbon, or soot. Implementation of the protocol does much to reduce air pollution while facilitating climate and health co-benefits. This convention has always been an example of science-based policy making and it is unique in that sense. It has been the example also for the Convention on Climate Change on Biodiversity. With 51 parties and eight protocols in force today, the results of the work under the convention so far have been significant. Since 1990, sulfur emissions in the region have been reduced by 70% and nitrogen oxide emissions by 40%. In particular, the decrease in sulfur emissions has led to healthier forest soils. Decoupling of economic growth and air pollution trends have prevented 600,000 premature deaths annually. Average life expectancy has increased by 12 months thanks to emission reductions. The work under the convention thus also contributes to the achievement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Sustainable Development Goals. However, as more and more countries around the globe face severe air pollution, the problem is increasingly being recognized at the global level. Ground-level ozone and particulate matter pollution are of major concern. 
it is increasingly evident that local air pollution, including in cities, is heavily influenced by the long-range and transboundary transport of pollutants, and that cities themselves are large sources of air pollution. A single country or even a city is not in a position to achieve significant improvements. And this is where the Convention has a lot of experience to offer and to bring into today's discussion how different countries, and in this case nowadays also cities and regions, can cooperate with each other in order to achieve more environmental benefits. This calls for multi-scale air pollution management and increased cooperation between different levels of government to reduce emissions at the local, national, regional and global levels. But at the same time, we also see that it is getting more complex, that air pollution is linked to several other issues. It is linked to energy policy, climate policy, it is linked to traffic policy, it is linked to agricultural policy. The Convention has always renewed itself. It should further renew to include linkages with those other policy fields. It should uh, uh, increase linkages with other policy levels. It should go into the cities and it should also open up to the hemispheric scale because to some extent, especially for ozone, the air pollution is certainly a global uh, issue. Lessons learned from the Convention can be used in other regions, thus contributing to solutions globally. The Convention will share experience and scientific expertise and strive to play a key role in the development of further policy cooperation between regions.